I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and, as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of m and Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter, calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the general Tom Thumb tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn through Barnum's own words about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. A tree found, tried, and shook. Since we are well into apple season here in New England, as well as in neighboring New York State, the country's second biggest apple producer, The title phrase of this section, plucked from a P.T. Barnum letter, seemed ripe for picking. Writing from France to his American museum manager Fortis Hitchcock on September 12, 1845, Barnum commented, No, my dear H., the museum, like Tom Thumb two years ago, is a tree found, tried, and shook. There is nothing now to do but pick up the fruit. These may sound like the words of a man well satisfied with his achievements, But as we'll see in letters written only about six weeks later, Barnum was not at all ready to sit back and just let the fruit fall. No, he was gathering ambitions by the bushel, and these were sustained by artful strategies and calculations, not just wishful thinking. No doubt he lay awake many a night mapping out an ever wider road to success. Barnum admitted to his uncle in the postscript to his letter of October 23rd, My brain is bursting with confusion and a multiplicity of affairs, and this must be my apology. I hope you'll not think I'm crazy, for really, I believe I am not, though I am nearly next door to it. The multiplicity of affairs is certainly one of the challenges and delights of reading Barnum's copybook letters, especially now we've come this far, about a third of the way through the volume. Never short on words, Barnum gives us a lot to unpack in almost every letter, And because of the rich content, we are now looking back more and more to earlier letters so as to connect the dots with new information. This iterative process, whereby we are building our understanding of 35-year-old Barnum, requires patience, but the rewards are well worth it as more things start to click. I expect this process will become even more interesting as we continue on. This time, we'll tap into the aforementioned September letter to Hitchcock, pairing it with the October 23rd letter to Allenson Taylor, a maternal side uncle with whom Barnum had worked for many years. Both of these are well worth reading in their entirety, though, fair warning, one is eight pages and the other six. 
There are several reasons, aside from the length, that these letters offer so much. First, Barnum consistently shares his views and gut feelings with certain correspondents, especially his uncle Taylor, Hitchcock, and showman competitor friend Moses Kimball. He is quite open and honest with them so far as we can tell, maybe not entirely so with Kimball, and thus provides us a window into his mind, far more than most letter writers who stick to conveying basic information. Second, Barnum had a close relationship with his uncle, though he vehemently disagreed with him on matters of religion, and with Hitchcock, whom he completely trusted. However, those two men did not always see eye to eye, and Barnum found himself in the role of peacemaker, begging them to see that getting along was to their mutual advantage. Third, Allenson Taylor is a hybrid among the cast of characters in the copybook, being both a family member and a business associate or partner. Topics, therefore, reflect both family and business concerns, and in those days personal and business finances seem to have been managed in a more fluid fashion with assets commingled. Thus, Hitchcock held the purse strings in Barnum's absence. For now, we'll focus on learning about Barnum's present and future business plans, for, as he wrote to his uncle, You know that my general fault has been my proneness to tell other people my plans and expose my business, but I fear that in the present case, I have erred on the other side, for had I told you and Hitchcock my plans, it would have saved a little development, which I fear has now occurred in my affairs, but which I hope, after all, is not of much consequence. But here were my plans, and you can judge after reading this whether they have put me in a fix or not. The issue in question was the purchase of Peel's Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Barnum freely admitted to his uncle, I have always been vexed at myself for not having bought the Baltimore Museum for you, and as my property has advanced, I have been trying to make up for that misstep. Fearing that your cloth trade was not turning out very lucrative, I determined to build and open an opposition museum in Baltimore, by which I felt sure of killing Peel, and then buying his stock for New Orleans or some other city. I intended you should have had half the museum if you wished. I never breathed this plan to a living being except Stratton, and he at once proposed coming in thirds and popping in Tom Thumb for a portion of the time to pay for the privilege of becoming a partner. I half thought that such an arrangement might be contrived for your and my benefit, and I told Stratton I guessed we could so contrive it. Unbeknownst to Barnum, until he received a letter from Taylor, his uncle had been working on his own to acquire a half-ownership in Peel's Baltimore Museum. Barnum had mixed feelings about this, telling his uncle, I hope that you will not be long chained to that rascal Peel, for he is a thoroughbred scamp and no mistake. Barnum, meanwhile, had been advising Hitchcock about buying the Peel Museum collection in New York City, though only to have Monsieur Guillaudeau, the museum's naturalist, box it up and put it in storage, except any specimens which may show well in the American Museum. It was his backup plan, as Barnum explained to Taylor, fearing the American Museum might burn down and find me without the stuff for another. At that point, the New York Peels Museum was in the hands of one seaman, who was asking $8,000 for it. Barnum strongly preferred to pay less, $6,000 to $7,000, and thought that if seaman held out, Hitchcock should go to Philadelphia to see about acquiring the original Peels Museum there. That said, Barnum had given Hitchcock permission to offer $8,000 to Seaman if absolutely necessary. He was gambling on Hitchcock not ending up with two major purchases simultaneously. With three different Peel collections in the mix here, and Barnum overseas, uncertain of what was or was not happening, it gets very confusing. I have to agree with Barnum's acknowledgement of his role in potentially creating, as he called it, a mixed-up bothering affair. In any case, Barnum explained his motive to Taylor thusly. As for my ultimately getting a finger in the Baltimore Museum, I do not in the least desire it unless doing so would be for your interest. My present idea is that it is necessary for me to have an interest in several museums in as many cities, so as to be able to engage such novelties as are necessary and which one museum alone could not afford to engage. Further, he saw opportunities for acquiring more interesting novelties in Europe that would draw American audiences. Again to Taylor, he wrote, If I have an interest in several museums, as I soon shall have if I live, 
I can the better afford to procure novelties in Europe. Being far from home, and often on his own as the advance man for the General Tom Thumb tour, Barnum had time to percolate schemes and strategies, considering ways to expand his operations far beyond Broadway and Ann Street in Lower Manhattan. Barnum was nothing if not a risk-taker. Nonetheless, he remained dedicated to his beloved American museum. As he explained to Hitchcock in a September 12th letter, I bought the museum originally for $12,000. Should a stranger come to me tomorrow with $100,000 cash in hand, I would not accept it for the American Museum. This, at first sight, looks foolish. And if I had no other money in the world, it would be so. For in that case, I should say, give me the 100000 For by so doing, I secure an independence, and thus part with an uncertainty for a certainty. But now it is different. Now I would say, I already have an independence, and therefore should be foolish to sell property for a sum which would produce me but $7,000 in interest per year, while the probability is that same property will produce double the amount yearly. Why should I not keep the property and stand the chance of gaining this double amount, since I can afford to run the risk? Barnum also considered his work to enhance the American Museum vital to his psyche. To Hitchcock, he opined, If it could be proved that a man could enjoy himself better by retiring, as it is called, and being idle than by being occupied, there might be an inducement for me to sell out. But as it is very evident that a man of my disposition would be happier in attending to that museum than in being idle, I have no excuse for parting with that profitable source of amusement. And so he continued, and with the fruits of his labor, his tree, found, tried, and shook, eventually turned into an orchard. First-rate attractions for the American Museum. P.T. Barnum was never lacking ideas for attractions to bring to his American Museum in New York, and he was certainly an enthusiastic supporter of a mid-19th century popular phenomena, visual illusions in a variety of forms. References to dissolving views, also known as magic lantern shows, and commissioning new views appear fairly regularly in Barnum's letters to museum manager Fortis Hitchcock, and he had learned about other intriguing optical instruments at the Royal Polytechnic Institution on Regent Street in London. Barnum was always eager to share ideas and plans with Hitchcock, and between late October and early November of 1845, they constitute a large portion of a three-part letter, pages 269 to 272 and 288 to 294. At that time, Barnum had left France to make a quick trip to London, and then returned to Paris, taking a short breather from the intensity of his work traveling through the country as the advance man for General Tom Thumb's entourage. The general would not be arriving in Paris for another couple of weeks, and this left Barnum time to plan, time to find people to hire, acquire, and ship things he wanted for his museum, and time to write about all this to Hitchcock. Since Hitchcock was among Barnum's closest friends, he also relayed bits of personal news. For example, relief that his wife Charity had decided against the purchase of a home in Bridgeport for $14,000, a topic that had bothered him greatly earlier in October. He also said he was feeling better again, and was forced to be moral by following the advice of French physicians who described his condition as fire in the stomach. They told him not to feed the fire, that he should stop smoking, drink nothing stronger than weak claret wine and water, and avoid vinegar. Barnum complied, and noted the benefit of no longer smoking. I find my breast much better. With those worries now settled, Let's turn to Barnum's plans for new and enhanced attractions at the museum, starting with his rationale for promoting the novelties sent from Europe. He explained his strategy to Hitchcock thusly. You must crack them up as being sent over by me. I was sorry you did not do the same by the orchestration, for it looks then as if we were scouring all Europe in search of novelties. And this has two good effects. First, it makes the people tickled to think our exertions are so strong to please them. And second, it frightens away opposition, for persons will say there's no use to go in opposition against the museum, for they have agents throughout Europe and can pick up 20 novelties to our one. Now, I don't know how the orchestration gets along, 
but I think if you had cracked it up as being sent by me from Paris expressly for the museum, it would have had a good effect. When you have such good attractions as at present, and they continue to draw, it is best to keep them, and only occasionally add something which gives a chance for a new line in the bill, although it may not of itself be much. Preparing for the holidays, when even larger crowds could be attracted to the museum, Barnum told Hitchcock to expect a shipment of new items. These he would receive by way of showman Moses Kimball in Boston. Now, here's something for the holidays. In a steamer of 19th November, Moses Kimball will receive a case for you. It will contain the following articles which I bought at the Polytechnic Institution. One physioscope, made specially for me, same size as that at the Polytechnic Institution. 20 pounds. One dissolving view of Lyon, with an effect to show the cathedral lighted. One dissolving view of American steamship Missouri, with effect to show her afterwards on fire. One dissolving view of Canton with moving figures. Your present attractions are first rate, and if you add the above for Christmas and New Year's, the people will be pleased. Among the first rate present attractions was the orangutan Barnum had mentioned in September, fearing it might have died due to the climate in New York. Barnum concurred with Hitchcock Yes, indeed, the orang is a good trick. Try to have him kept warm, and I should say let him be a standing dish at the museum. He will pay well there as long as he lives, and that will not be long, I am afraid. I shall send you the trumpets, so that you can use them right after the holidays, perhaps before. Presumably, this refers to the trumpet machine mentioned in a postscript to his September 28th letter to Hitchcock. I have written to Paris about the trumpeters, but half think I shall not get automaton figures with the trumpet machine, for the figures will cost as much or more than the machine, I fear. Barnum was also on the hunt for statues while in Europe. He told Hitchcock, If possible, I shall look about here for an anatomical Venus, also for statues for the top of the museum. Give me the exact height of museum so that I will know the size necessary for statues. The physioscope, mentioned in the list above, was an optical instrument akin to the magic lantern. According to one source, the physioscope was designed to depict the human face in colossal dimensions upon the screen, and described it as a modification of the magic lantern. The New York Herald included in its September 5, 1845 issue an advertisement for displays at the New York Polytechnic Institute, Lafayette Hall, 595 and 597 Broadway. The ad announced, Two entirely new optical instruments, the proteoscope and the physioscope, will be shown, whose effects only have to be seen to draw crowds of admirers. Barnum had to be competitive, even if not always the first to show some new invention, and so he may have put in his order at about that time to the London-based Polytechnical Institution for a customized physioscope. To Hitchcock, Barnum explained what would likely be required to set up the new physioscope, a job that would fall to the Englishman Professor Swift, whom Barnum had hired in early 1845. Swift had been brought on to set up the magic lantern equipment and narrate the dissolving views, which were the current rage in visual entertainment. Demonstrating the powers of this new instrument would be added to his duties. Barnum wrote, The physioscope, if well managed, will tickle the people down to the ground. Swift must rehearse it first with some good-natured laughing person, as much depends on the person shown in it. It should be an elderly person by rights. I think the focus of the physioscope cannot reach so far as that of the views. At the Polytechnic, they are obliged to have a curtain for physioscope several feet in front of that for views. I suppose you will have to do the same. In that case, the curtain for physioscope might be over the orchestra and be made to roll up to the ceiling and drop down when needed. With the magic lantern apparatus already in place, Swift would need to expand or rearrange his setups and management of the optical equipment in the American Museum's theater. Barnum was not, however, counting on Swift staying in his job because there had already been a dust-up about his salary, and with Swift's wife having remained in England, it was possible he'd return in the not-too-distant future, which might not be such a bad thing. Barnum had therefore scouted out other prospects for the position and found two likely candidates while in London. With a plan in place, he told Hitchcock, Damn that, Swift. I have now written to Brettall to have him keep paying Mrs. Swift, since her husband was still employed. 
I found in London a man who fully understands the views and microscope, etc. He has shown them at the Polytechnic Institution and is recommended by that institution. He is not as refined as Swift, still he can address the public. He is steady and faithful. He knows how to make the gas, gas for the magic lanterns. In fact, everything about all the optical views and instruments, but no other science. He is, however, also a good bird and animal stuffer and could help Guido when not engaged otherwise. He stands ready to go to America for $12 and probably for $10 per week. I to pay $50 for his expenses to America. If you think best, I'll send him. The $10 or $12 per week was considerably less than the salary Hitchcock had felt forced to pay Swift after he complained that living in New York was more expensive than Barnum had led him to believe. Barnum was especially annoyed by the three months it had taken Swift to construct the setup for the dissolving views, time lost before any profits could be realized. Still, he knew he needed Swift's expertise, at least for the time being, and had instructed Hitchcock to raise the man's salary if push came to shove. Finding that had been done, Barnum told Hitchcock, You are paying him strong now, and he ought to be busy every minute to earn $18 per week. Now, with a second possible candidate for Swift's job, Barnum added in his letter, Another man, a magician from the Adelaide Gallery, will play the magician and attend to gaz, gas, views, etc. He understands it all, and will do all for ten or twelve dollars per week. He has got an extensive magical apparatus, so henceforth we can have one of these chaps when we want, and I'll send one at once, if you think best to swap Swift. Professor Swift may or may not be on his way back to England in the weeks or months ahead, but in the meantime, we still have more clues to explore about the exciting attractions to be seen at Barnum's Museum and other New York City venues in the 1840s. Illusions at the American Museum Earlier, we learned of Barnum's plans for a brand new attraction at the American Museum, a physioscope, which he described in a letter to Fortis Hitchcock, manager of the museum. This week, we'll return to that same letter, written between October 25th and 31st, 1845, for there is yet more to explore about the exciting new Dissolving Views, also known as Magic Lantern Shows, as well as an older kind of popular attraction, large-scale panoramas, the immersive entertainment of their day. Visual illusions in a variety of new and older formats were a reliable draw, and Barnum's desire to offer changing, dynamic attractions was a good counterpoint to the traditional displays of natural history collections and artwork in his museum. Earlier in 1845, while in London, Barnum had hired Professor Swift to move to New York and set up the museum's lecture hall, or theater, with various optical devices, including a camera obscura, and the two-lens projector to show dissolving views, images that gradually changed from one scene to another, captivating audiences with the appearance of magical transformation. This decision involved considerable expense on top of what Barnum had already spent purchasing glass slides and optical instruments, as he noted to one correspondent, between $2,000 and $3,000. After several months of preparation, Swift had everything ready to open to the public, and Barnum was pushing to get newspaper coverage, not only through ads, but also with editorials praising the American Museum's shows. He was also trying to expand his audience beyond the city to attract tourists, and instructed Hitchcock to promote the dissolving views in all other weekly papers, scientific, political, religious, and neutral papers which go into the country. As he wrote to C.D. Stewart on September 11th, I think that those dissolving views ought to attract the attention and quarter dollar of every person who visits New York. By late summer, the investment in dissolving views was showing promise. Barnum noted in his August 25th letter to his wife, Charity, that Hitchcock had reported, The dissolving views are drawing well, and the business is beginning to increase, and will be excellent as soon as the weather is cooler. But success would be short-lived if the material became stale so Barnum was anxious to keep his shows fresh by acquiring new views. Among a list of new items, including the physioscope that Barnum had bought and shipped off to America in mid-November, were three dissolving views. Presumably, these were purchased off the shelf, not specially ordered. They included a scene of Lyon, France, 
with an effect to show the cathedral lighted, a view of the American steamship Missouri with the effect to show her afterwards on fire, and a scene of Canton, China, with moving figures. Barnum was now aiming to have views of his own choosing made, and that would require hiring artists to paint the slides. Being in Europe provided better opportunities to have the views made there than in New York. Presumably, Barnum felt that the results would be higher quality, and he had long since planned to have a view of William Penn's treaty made. On a couple of occasions, he remarked that he was still awaiting a picture of Penn's treaty from his friend Moses Kimball in Boston. Apparently, it eventually arrived, for Barnum told Hitchcock that a Mr. Welch, who goes by this steamer, will hand you a view of Penn's treaty, for which I paid five pounds. Save it for Christmas, and then crack it up with the other three views named below. Barnum was now relying on his manager to help get a bigger plan in motion. He advised Hitchcock, I can have no American views painted in London unless you send me copies, and if possible, send the pictures same size that our views are, for in that case they can be put behind the glass and painted same size for half what they would cost if the painter must make them smaller or larger than the copy. If you can find some book printed containing pictures of the proper size, then you can go to the publisher of the book and get the pictures separate and send them to my best friend Brettel on Rupert Street, London. Barnum's strategy for spending the least money possible on the copying of images mirrors the guidance he had given Professor Swift on September 29th. My dear fellow, you must always keep improving our attractions and at the same time have a strict regard to economy. I want you to feel interested in my affairs and keep driving ahead in the same way that you know I am always driving business. By doing so, you will advance both my interests and yours. To be sure he knew what views were already in hand and the optimal size to order the new ones, Barnum directed Hitchcock to ask for Swift's input. I wish you to send me an exact list of every view we now have, and also tell me what views you want. Let Swift tell me what size is best for the lanterns, also whether pictures only five inches can be shown in them. Barnum was also interested in acquiring different panoramas, or dioramas as he called them, for the museum. Telling Hitchcock, I have given up trying to buy the diorama of Napoleon's funeral in Paris. He turned back to considering others that were stateside, and which compared favorably to those he had just seen in London. He suggested to Hitchcock, Perhaps you had better arrange with Harrington to buy or hire his moving dioramas. I believe that he is not now the owner of them, and that they are in pawn in St. Louis. If you could buy them cheap, unless they are spoiled, it would be a good dodge for a change. They always please and are very pretty. There are none better in Europe. I went to see some in London, admission one dollar, four English shillings, and they were not half so fine as Harrington's. His sea view and fairy grotto beat out all those in London. The terms panorama and diorama seem to have been used at least somewhat interchangeably at the time, and as there were variations in the way the structures and presentation formats were configured, it can be a challenge to pin down exactly what is meant. Today, a diorama is understood to be a static scene with a realistic background painted to give the illusion of depth and mounted in a curve. A three-dimensional foreground is created in front of the backdrop with taxidermy animals, faux plant material, artifacts, or objects to complete the illusion of an actual environment. Barnum uses the term diorama more broadly, and in this letter refers to moving dioramas, which may mean mechanical theaters. He went on to advise Hitchcock, You might be arranging so as to bring them out in the winter or spring. In this country, France, managers engage attractions six months in advance, and it is not a bad dodge for them, as a person never gets caught without any attractions. Towards the last, I only paid Harrington $15 a week for his dioramas, and if we owned them, I think we could always get them worked for that, and they might be on our stage at the back without interfering with the other performances. Think of it. That Barnum was quite familiar with Harrington's work is evident in his letter. In fact, many New Yorkers would have known of these dioramas over a period of years. The context is clarified in the Biographical Dictionary of Panoramists of the English-Speaking World, by Ralph Hyde and others, unpublished courtesy of the Bill Douglas Cinema Museum, University of Exeter, England. From these entries, we learn that Henry Harrington, incorrectly spelled in one entry as Hannington, 
and his brother William were painters and showmen, and from 1835 they presented moving dioramas, in fact a mechanical theater, at the City Saloon opposite St. Paul's Church on Broadway, New York. Barnum's Museum was also in that location, at the corner of Ann Street. The entry for Harrington H. describes him as a transparency painter, and notes that, with W.J. Harrington, between 1835 and 1837, he operated Marble Buildings, Dioramic Institute, on Broadway near Ann Street, presenting changing displays of dioramas. There they exhibited the moving panorama of Luna discoveries and diorama of the Deluge. Perhaps the sea view Barnum mentioned to Hitchcock was the diorama of the Deluge. The Harringtons also advertised their grand moving diorama at the American Museum in December of 1835. This predates Barnum's ownership, which commenced in late December 1841. Prior to Barnum, the American Museum was operated by John Scudder and then his descendants. Clearly, the venerable White Marble Museum building was no stranger to these grand visual illusions. Wrapping up this deep dive into Barnum's lengthy epistle, I'll share an amusing bit that adds to the story of the fine porcelain and silver items Barnum had purchased at an estate auction in Paris. In a previous letter, we learned that to his chagrin, Barnum owed the U.S. Customs an enormous sum, $600, levied on the luxury goods he had sent home. To rub salt into the wound, Barnum had learned that if only he and Charity had used the dishes while they were in Paris, the import duty would not have applied, or not at that rate. In the current letter, Barnum wryly told Hitchcock, My box number two, containing part of the porcelain dinner service, is now here. It was left by mistake. I'll send it one of these days, and remember you have paid all the duty on it. I'll smuggle enough if I live long to get my $600 back, which you paid duty. One can only imagine Hitchcock's initial reaction to this comment. He, who followed instructions precisely, and presumably the letter of the law as well. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino, and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.